So my name is uh, Glenn Hilton. I am the president and CEO of ImageX. We're based up in Vancouver, Canada, and um, we, uh, our clientele is 90% of our clients are actually in the States. Uh, we've been involved as a Drupal uh, web shop since the uh, beginning of 2006. We transitioned from video production beforehand. I started the, the business ImageX back in 2001. And uh, probably for me, the, the biggest challenge I found when I transitioned over to Drupal was not actually getting sales um, and new clients, but actually finding good people. That was the most difficult thing that I found as soon as I optimized our keyword search and began to really put an emphasis on our SEO and our pay-per-click to be able to drive traffic to our website, I was so overwhelmed with business I couldn't possibly keep up with all the leads that came through between the period of 2006 and mid-2008 when the recession hit. And so I was just constantly looking for uh, Drupal talent. And uh, I found really quickly and learned a lot about hiring uh, the right people versus the wrong people and some really, really hard lessons through that period of time. So today I wanted to share a few of those with you and at the same time have this interactive so that you folks could uh, share some of the things that you've been learning along the path too and we could all uh, gain something out of it. So a couple of years ago, Dries was doing a presentation uh, at DrupalCon. Dries, is, uh, for those of you who are new to Drupal, is the founder of Drupal and uh, he made a couple of statements that uh, really stood out to me. He says, um, there are two things impacting Acquia's future that concern me. Acquia is, is sort of that umbrella organization that trees is the, uh, the um, uh, kind of the leader behind and uh, that, that is really helping with support and hosting and, and really uh, developing the Drupal movement and helping market Drupal uh, around the world. And he said that uh, the there's two things that are impacting Acquia's future that still concern me. The first is the scarcity of great Drupal talent and Drupal's growth. The demand for Drupal's experts continues to be much larger than, than the supply. It limits the adoption of Drupal by our customers, the growth of our partners, as well as our own ability to hire Drupal talent. So. That isn't something that we just experienced uh, within our shop. It's something that across the board, as I began to travel to different Drupal camps, to the actual cons and talk to other uh, individuals who own Drupal web agencies or businesses that were starting to adopt Drupal and had internal uh, IT departments, they were all facing the same challenges. Where do we find um, this good Drupal talent? So what I wanted to talk a little bit about is just some of the approaches that we've ta taken over the years to try to identify some of these folks. So there's no real one silver bullet that has enabled us to kind of go, bam, this is it, this is the way. Um, what we've done is, is uh, with our team, um, we've really started to try to, as Ben was mentioning a little bit earlier there when he was giving his intro, We've tried to really market ourselves as a company and that the energy we put into marketing to our prospects is the same kind of energy we put into marketing our company to um, candidates to work for us. And so we put a lot of time and focus on that because it's really important to brand ourselves as an agency that people would want to work for and not just expect that by posting a job we're going to have really good solid candidates coming to us. So we've kind of developed a, a series of concentric circles and those circles are kind of like a, our three to six month plan and then our one to two year plan and then our three to five year plan. So that three to five year plan would be kind of like we need to develop a farm system so that within three to five years we have a real great uh, funnel of new talent coming into our organization. So I'm just going to walk through a few of the things that we've been doing to help build each of those um, concentric circles out. The first is the obvious. It's, it's that short-term plan of the job boards. So up in Vancouver, we've been utilizing um, probably for any management positions, the number one uh, job board that we've been using is LinkedIn. So if we're looking for a marketing professional, a sales professional, a project manager, um, any of uh, the individuals within those sectors, we're going to use LinkedIn. That's our, our first choice. We've also found um, Craigslist has been helpful. Um, we've used Indeed. Um, and uh, there's some local sites, niche sites that we've used, like there's one called Tech Vibes. And then we've also used Drupal.org. And 
the groups.drupal.org, which is specific to Vancouver, has actually been really helpful for us in finding Drupal developers. Um, LinkedIn hasn't been helpful for finding Drupal developers for us. Um, that's been our experience. I'd really be interested, for those of you in the room here, who have been actually hiring Drupal talent before, is there anything else that you found useful from a job board perspective besides the ones that I've mentioned that you could share with the group? TechCrunch? Yeah. Has that been good for you? Yeah. Yeah, we haven't tried TechCrunch yet. Yeah. Yeah. Dice. Dice. Yeah. Great. So, so far we've um, heard from the audience that DICE and uh, TechCrunch are two options and DICE sounds like one that's actually been working but the East Coast has been pretty strong. I'll repeat some of the stuff you guys say just so it gets picked up on the screencast here if you're wondering why. <laughs> All right. So, the next thing is presenting and training at conferences and events. For us, this has been huge. We've found that Anytime we go to a Drupal camp, anytime we go to a Vancouver, like our Vancouver Drupal users group, um, or a Pacific Northwest Drupal Summit, uh, DrupalCon itself, that when we get an opportunity to have our team up there and presenting, it's been huge for us on attracting new talent to our company. Usually if I can get some of our guys up there and they're presenting, let's say the latest modules that they're building or some innovation that they're doing, uh, showing themselves to be thought leaders within the industry, that attracts talent. Smart people like to work with smart people, and they don't want to just go to any shop. They want to see who are the leading shops, and those are the shops often that are really getting aggressive about getting in there and saying, we're going to get in front of you, and we're going to share some of the stuff. Ben? Yes. Yeah, and so we usually start with them in baby steps because not all of our guys come in with a marketing mindset. A lot of times developers don't think about marketing. That's why Drupal is so freaking butt ugly when it first came out, right? It's because they're not thinking about how it looks. They're thinking of the functionality. So you go to like Drupal 4.7, for those of you who started way, way back when, and you went to it and you're like, oh, this is a mess. This is, this is awful. And you went to WordPress and you're like, oh, this is nice and clean. Marketers and designers are often behind a lot of the, the development of WordPress, whereas Drupal was formulated by developers. And developers don't naturally think about marketing themselves. And so you have to train them on that. So we, we'll have our marketing department working with them, and we'll be getting them to do baby steps. So we usually start them off by saying, every Wednesday afternoon we have our dev team meeting, perfect opportunity for you to learn how to present. So get up in front of the rest of the people in your, on your team and share about the stuff you've been building. Share about the stuff you're thinking about building. Show us some of the stuff you're experimenting with. And then we do uh, Friday Lunch and Learns. This is the second place where you can share. The third place is Go to the Vancouver Drupal users group and get up in front of them. You, hey, you're doing a great job. That's fantastic. Everybody liked what you shared. You could do it there. And so we just help them take those baby steps until eventually they're presenting at you know, Pacific Northwest Drupal Summit. And then we're getting them to put pitch sessions in for DrupalCon. And DrupalCon's tough because only 15% of the sessions will get chosen there. So you really got to earn your stripes. You got to get your name known out there. So presenting is not an easy one for them and not everybody's a presenter. But if they keep working on it, I mean, writing might be the other means of it. It's, it's actually through case studies, blog posts, and, and so on and so forth that you can still show yourself as a thought leader along with social media. Next is partners. So in the Drupal community, when I first got involved, one of the things that I just thought was fantastic about it is just that Drupal is not just a software technology. It is actually a community of people. And all of those people working together is what makes Drupal so powerful. So when you go to your first Drupal camp and you're like, wow, there's all of these people here and they're sharing all of this information with me and it's fantastic. I'm learning so much. But then you start learning that it's more than them just sharing about how to theme a site or how to do coding. They're sharing with you things like how to run your business, how to do marketing, how to do sales. And you're like, wow. Why are you sharing that information? That blows my mind. Nobody, nobody in any other industry is sharing like this. And that's where I started to get excited because the open source movement was beyond just software. It was a community of people who were helping each other. 
And as I started to get involved in at the business level, I started to make friendships with some of the other CEOs. Now some of those guys are some of my closest friends I have in my, in my life. I share with them almost everything. I'm, every day I'm on Skype connecting with some of my friends. It's been fantastic because as a CEO, oftentimes you feel like you're all by yourself. And when you are running your own business, it's awful at times. Sometimes I'm awake all night long. I'm, I'm, I'm just like, what am I going to do to pay my employees next week? And if you have other people who are going through the same things as you, it's amazing. And once you start to build trust with them, this group of guys, Kevin's one of those guys. Um, this group of guys, I trust implicitly. I share tons with them. And over the last five to six years, they've been helping me uh, when I've had really difficult times in my business. And I've been helping them. And we'll share stuff. And oftentimes it will be like we go through a hiring process. And I've been able to um, you know, hire some great people. And I've got two or three candidates that were runners up. And I wasn't able to hire them, but I'll contact some of my mates up and say, hey, are you looking for such and such? I noticed you're posting on this. And I can send those individuals over to them. And vice versa, they can do that with, with me. That's one of the amazing things of being involved in the open source community is business is done in a different way. And you can be a part of that, and you can avail yourself to that, and you can start to connect with these people within this community. Get involved if you aren't in your local Drupal users group. There's one right here in Orange County as well. I know it's starting up the, the one in LA. Uh, it's a great way to connect with other people who are like-minded, who are wanting to share the stuff that they're learning and be able to share some of the success from the, the good things that are happening within their businesses. And there we go, that's, that's the local community involvement. And I found that for us, as we started to get really involved, we found a lot of good talent within that community. And those people would be able to connect with us because as, as they'd start to learn about you, they learn about your heart, they learn about what makes you tick, they learn about your values, they're like, that's the kind of company I wanna work for. And that's stronger than money for people, it is you guys are talking the same values as me. And I'm working for a company right now, and all they care about is the bottom line. All they care about is profits. And that's not what I care about in my life. I want to find a company that cares about something bigger than that. And so as you get involved in the community, people will find that out, that, sorry, will find out about that, about you, and they'll say, you're the type of person that I'd really like to work with. And that's huge. The next is being able to open up your place. Uh, usually once to twice a year, we'll open up our office and we'll have like a, an open house. We'll have a party, we'll bring in like a caterer, and we'll just promote it out through the uh, community and just say, hey, come on in, find out more about our business, meet our team. Fantastic way for people who are interested, or maybe they're in a job, they're not really happy in their job, <coughs> they hear about this opportunity, they come out and check you out. The next is on campus. Now this is more in the three to five for us, and sometimes in the one to two. But well, we've started to develop relationships with all the local colleges and universities in our surrounding area. So we're, we're going to all the tech fairs at BCIT, at Capilano, at, at Kwantlen, at UBC, at SFU. It's very time consuming and it's costly because every single time we're going to those tech fairs, we're renting out booth space, and we're getting there, and we're getting in front of those students. But we want them to know ImageX. We want them to have that in their head. They're in first year, they're in second year, they see our company, we're there at the tech fair. We're a viable option for them for a career path as they start to get to know us. We then started doing things like pub nights. We'd rent out a local pub, we'd have a bunch of drink tickets, we'd do a bunch of games, we'd invite all the students from the computer science department to come on out to that, um, do a, a, a blitz beforehand, put up posters and events and so on and so forth and have them out. We then started doing things like pizza parties and Drupal training. So when we first interacted with computer science at UBC, we started to find out that the very first class we ran, uh, we had 80 people show up. 10% of them had actually even heard of Drupal before. But they came out because they wanted to learn about new technologies. And out of us doing that, we started to find co-op students, interns, and eventually hires as they came out of university. And a lot of those students at this point in time, they know about Google, they know about Amazon, they know about Facebook, and that's where they're heading. But some of them might be very interested in working with smaller uh, shops like yourselves. So looking at that as an option is, it's time consuming and costly, but if you have a plan to really grow your company, you want to be thinking beyond just that immediate six months. 
sorry, I went the wrong direction on my button, so we're going to reload these here. Next is recruiting agencies. We use recruiting agencies periodically, and they're very costly. They'll usually charge you a pretty penny. You're looking at anywhere from like 7,500 to 20 grand, really depending on the position and, and the salary range of that individual. But there has been, I think, three occasions in the past where we've actually brought in a recruiting agency to help us find a really critical or key position within our organization, and it's been well worth it. Um, so it's worth considering and keeping a good, good relationship with, with recruiters that you trust. Uh, unfortunately, in that space, there's a lot of them that are hard to trust, and you have to really be choosy uh, about that because uh, that whole industry, the way it works, is by those commissions. And so they can place somebody, and then six months later, they might be approaching and tapping that person's shoulder who they replaced uh, and, and seeing if they can get that person to move again because it's another commission for them. And you really want to be able to be sure that the individuals you're working with are, are sound and are going to uh, really have your long-term uh, vision in mind for where you want to grow your organization. Next is blogging and social. Getting your team blogging is a great way to attract talent to your company. Our blog has a number of different tracks, and one of those tracks is um, the individuals that we're wanting to uh, get in front of that hopefully one day will want to work with us. So being able to, again, show yourself as a thought leader in the space. Also using social media, we use LinkedIn, um, Twitter, Facebook, and Google+. Uh, are, are the means that we're trying to reach out to, to individuals there. And with each of those, we'll use those also as screening tools as we're looking at candidates too. Um, the number one thing as we look at candidates is LinkedIn, is do they have um, their LinkedIn profile filled out? Do they have their accomplishments from each of the positions that they've worked at? Do they have their education all there? Do they have any endorsements? Do they have any testimonials? Are they involved in any community groups? All of those things that will be things we're looking, we're looking at. On their Twitter, We'll be watching how they operate. Are they people that tend to you know, have a lot of drama around them? Are they people that are uh, interacting and providing thoughtful comments? Are they sharing good links? Are they reading? Are they up to date on where technology is at? And are they really pushing the envelope? So those are all things you can look for uh, in candidates. Communicating values. This is something that on our website is front and central in our about section is the values of our company. So we have five overarching values. We have um, those coming through almost everything we do within our company and I'll find that probably one out of three to four candidates that are applying for jobs will mention the values. They'll say, reading through your values was one of the reasons we chose your company. If it wasn't from their initial communications, it would usually be through the interview process. So being able to identify your core values as an organization, put those in print and have those clear in front of the individuals who are coming to check you out is really helpful. And the final one has been uh, for us has been incentivizing our team. So being able to offer incentives to them to help us. Now if you thought about recruitment, recruitment is a huge cost. So you, you could potentially drop 10 grand to have a recruiter help you find a candidate for your job. Why not get your team looking for you? We've got 30 individuals on our team. If we can incentivize them to be always looking for new talent for the posted positions, that's great. So we started a campaign where we began to you know, offer our team iPads and saying, hey, if you can help us find a new um, candidate for this position, we'll give you an iPad. And that really started to work out great for us. And within a year, we had given away five or six iPads to different team members. And then we started expanding that out into the community around us too and saying, hey, we're giving out iPads if you can help us find such and such for this position. So whatever means that you choose to go um, and, and help get your, your own group of people uh, speaking about you and sharing about the opportunities, um, try to incentivize them. What to look for. So some of the things that I found have been really key for us, the first is obviously the quality of work. Um, when we, we look at candidates and individuals, uh, depending on the position, let's say if you're looking at a design position, it's usually pretty easy. You go to their portfolio, you look at the, 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 uh, the work that they've done there, and you can kind of scrutinize it and get a good idea if they have the skill set that you're looking for. Sometimes that's a little bit tougher with maybe a developer, where their code you're going to have to dig into and figure out 
how they how they do their coding and how uh, the caliber of that code. We'll talk about that in our inter er, in our interview process on how we go about um, servicing that information. The next is: Are they resourceful and industrious? I mentioned that before as we we're talking about their social media. Uh, are they people that are avid readers? Uh, usually in the interview process, that's some of the questions I'm asking them. I'm saying, yeah, what kind of books have you been reading the last you know, little while? What's the latest book you've read? Or what's the um, RSS feeds that you have on your reader? Or um, what, what sites are you looking at on, on Twitter? Or uh, what blogs do you subscribe to at this point in time? Um, and if I'm not getting answers on any of those things, that's usually a big flag for us because for us, we're looking for people. One of our values is always evolving. We're looking for people who are constantly learning. And we find that those people um, have so much more to bring to the table. The next is community involvement. Um, we'll ask about community involvement. Sometimes we'll say, you know, what? I've always been meaning to contribute. You know, I've been involved with Drupal for a long time, and I've always wanted to, but my former employers would never, ever pay me to do so. That's a flag for us, too. If, we're, if it's part of our values of our company is, is that we're, con we're contributing, we want to see individuals who already have been participating in that and are already giving back because that's going to fit with where we're going as an organization. But really, this is your guys' values, so I'm just sharing mine with you right now, what we're looking for, so uh, take these and, and uh, weigh them as, as, as you see fit. The next is their communication skills. Uh, one of the things I was really impressed with when I talked to one of the individuals from Lullabot was they, uh, this was a conversation I had with them a couple of years back and they were just saying how they um, only hire people who have fantastic communication skills and they've, they've um, in the past hired people who were very skilled but maybe weren't as strong communicators and they realized it was a mistake for them because one of their values in their company is communication is critical and as I started to look back over the past and I saw you know what a lot of the breakdown a lot of the, the projects that went wrong were based on poor communication you know we made assumptions and we, we thought we understood, oh, that's what you mean. And so we built this for you. Oh, no, no, that wasn't at all what we meant. You know, and our communication skills are really critical in this industry. So we've made that um, something that we test voraciously through the interview process. The next is follow-up, expressing interest. We really want to see somebody that is very passionate about working for us. We've often been burned by making decisions when our gut inside was sort of like, I don't think they really want this, but I really want them, so I'm going to compete hard to get them, even though that they, I think they might like this other opportunity better. I'm going to up the, the, the dollar figure so that they're going to choose us. And that was a mistake. We should have really uh, gone with our gut and recognized that if they don't really want this, this is probably not right. And so somebody who's expressing interest, who's following up with us, is really showing us that they want to work with our organization is a very good sign. And the final one, which I've talked about before, is, is that they really align with our values, that it just, it's a trigger for them. It, it stands out as something that uh, really matters. <coughs> Next, we'll move on to our screening process. Before we do, is there any questions or comments or input? Paula? How do we uh, suss out their communication skills? Is that what, you, what yeah, your question was? Awesome. So I'm going to touch on that as I go through this screening process because that's a great question. So when we do our screening process, now this one, as it's laid, laid out here, would be typically for a developer. But I'll just go through this one so you kind of understand. So our very first thing to do would be an email screen. So um, we use a tool called Resumator. And Resumator allows us to do an iframe on our website and pulls in all the data from Resumator.com. And Resumator then allows us to fill in a whole bunch of information. It's cool because it allows you to fill in things like their LinkedIn profiles, their Twitter profiles, all the information that you want to be able to gather so that you don't have to go dig it out and try to find it later. It gets brought through to you. So that resume arrives in your inbox right off your website. And the first thing we'll do is we'll send them an email screen. And in that email screen, we'll have a questionnaire. And each, each position will have a separate group of questions on it. So one of the communication things we'll look for is when they respond to that questionnaire, if they've just filled it out really, really briefly and shortly and not put a lot of effort into it, if there's a lot of grammar and spelling mistakes, it just immediately makes me think, either this person's not attentive to detail, which is one of our values, quality is huge to us, 
or they just don't, they're, they're just kind of like doing the shotgun approach where they're just going out blasting away and hoping something's going to hit here. And that's not a good fit. If I see their cover letter, it's like addressed to another company and the information in that is wrong and they called me the wrong name and stuff like that. And I see that all the time. It's just a huge cue that they've really not put the due diligence or effort into this that I'm looking for. So that email screen helps me save a lot of time before I get into the process of getting onto the phone with them and so on and so forth. The second is the phone screen. So I used to do the, that first interview in person and then I'd realized like five minutes into it, I made a big, big mistake with inviting this person out and having you know two or three people from our staff sit down. We're gonna blow an hour here because this is just not going to work at all. I should have gotten on the phone ahead of time and figured out their communication skills because I can learn a lot about that just by having a phone conversation with them if they're gonna have what we're looking for and what we're needing for the specific position that we're working with. So that's our second gauge is that conversation. Right now, that will happen by our HR coordinator. She'll screen all the candidates after she's gone through those first email screens and do those phone calls. And she won't even bring them to us if, if she doesn't feel like they're going to meet those requirements. The next is the knowledge test. So again, they haven't had an in-person interview at all yet. We've, in the, in the dev arena, we have a knowledge test that we had our own devs put together. It's seven different areas, HTML, CSS, PHP, Drupal front end, Drupal back end, logic, and something else. And so they'll go through that. Each of those sections is about five minutes of, of questions that they'll have opportunity to respond to. Then we'll take all of those results and we've been doing this for the last few years. It's the same test for all the guys who go through it. And then we'll get a number score. And so we'll know like, hey, if they score anything between 40 to 50, they're probably a junior dev, 60 to 70, they're an intermediate, 70 to 80, they're probably an experienced or close to senior anything 80 plus, they're a total hardcore senior dev. And so we've been able to just quickly identify them just on how they scored on that test. Then we'll look at other information, their Drupal.org ID, um, their portfolio, their blog, and their, their social media, and uh, be able to get an idea of just a, an overall picture of how they operate, um, how much they're really pouring into being able to give back in the community if that's a value, and so on and so forth. Then the next step is that face-to-face. -face. At that face-to-face -face interview, usually for us, it's in bringing in our uh, director of technology, myself, and our uh, HR coordinator to sit down and meet with those candidates and go through a one-hour interview with them. And in that period of time, we're usually doing a cultural fit interview. And we're just trying to see, is this person going to be a really great fit for our company and where we're going? If they go through that well, then the next is technical screening. So we'll bring them back in and we'll usually do, like what we have right now is we have a module that we built and then we broke it. And so then we'll sit them down and they'll have like an hour to fix it. And then we can go over and review all the code and all the angles and all the ways that they tried to go at it to just learn a lot more about how they approach and problem solve. If they go through that, then we bring them back for a team interview. And at that point of time, and this is the hard part, um, that's when I check out of the process and I will say um, whatever you guys decide. Uh, I've given my thumbs up. I think this person is good, but if you guys don't think so, you have to work with them, you absolutely have the right to say no. If even one of you says no, we're not going to hire this person. And that's terribly hard because there's been some people that I've been just like, I love this person. This person's going to be awesome. And they're like, Glenn, no, no, it's not going to work and we didn't hire them. And so that is definitely uh, a tough part for us, but it's been really good because these guys are gonna work with them every single day. So it's really important that they get a sense that this is gonna be a really good fit for us and our team. And from there, we'll go on to uh, extend an offer and then do a reference check. And it might be um, flipped around, but usually the offer will come if they're already in an existing position and we don't want to jeopardize that going through the reference check process. But otherwise, we will usually do the reference check, then the offer. And that's kind of the screening process. How are we doing for time? What time do we wrap up here? Yeah? Any questions on the uh, interview process before we move on? Ben? Sending them out on sort of 
sort of a freelance project and with a very low profile and somewhat overhead, but have you ever thought about doing anything of that nature? Bringing someone in and just being like, I'm going to basically assess you on how you work on an actual project. No, we haven't uh, done that. At this point, we have done like with contractors where we'll give them a test project to work on. And sometimes when we feel uncertain about somebody, we will actually start them as a contractor and give them a test project for just at, you know, we think they got it, but we're not sure before we make that step into employment. But the, uh, the technical screening at this point is usually just that module test for us. And then our team of devs meeting with them, running all their questions by uh, that individual and then vice versa. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, this is just a comment. Um, I've seen technical interviews go bad before because uh, sometimes uh, some of the technical guys realize this guy is smarter than them and uh, they feel correct. And they'll, they'll start asking him obscure questions and trying to say them. Um, mm. Yeah, I've seen that happen. Mm. So it, it, sometimes you get a bad apple in the mix, you know. And, uh, I, I've seen a lot. It just depends on your dad. Devs can be very catty and uh, very jealous. You know, especially when you're dealing with very smart people. You know, hmm. uh, they'll try and sink the potential candidate because they don't want them to steal their glory. You know? Yeah. So, no. Hmm, that's a really good point. So um, uh, the comment, I'm just going to add it here for our recording, was just that uh, sometimes uh, candidates can be uh, subjugated by the dev team if there's a, a threat that, that they feel with that individual. Something I haven't experienced in, in the last couple of years that we've been doing it, but definitely um, something we'd be aware of. We usually bring in two to three of our top devs that we really trust, and they know our needs and know that we want to bring on great talent and that they wouldn't want to bring somebody that they couldn't give that work to and really trust. But yeah, good feedback. Next, let's move on to retention. So as we all know, losing that top talent isn't fun. As you can see, the James jersey at the bottom there, and you think about uh, the poor folks at the, the Cleveland Cavaliers who, who uh, were incredibly shocked and saddened the day that they heard he was going to be walking out, leaving them and going down south. Um, not just the team, not just the ownership, but the entire state. Uh, people were out in the streets burning his jersey. Uh, they were so upset. They were so saddened. I mean, he was a hometown boy from Akron who was leaving them and going away. Um, it's an awful, awful feeling. And if you are an owner or you're a manager and you have directs and you've sat in your office and at the end of the day on Friday, there's a little knock on the door and you look over at the door and you're, hey, how's it going? And you look on their face and you read their face and you know what's just happening. Or you looked out the window and you saw them go outside and you saw them sitting in their car talking on their cell phone and something in your heart just went, why are they doing that? It's not a good feeling. It's awful. So I want to talk a little bit about how we can see it coming, what we can do to prevent it, what are some of the things that we can help increase the retention within our teams. We all know how costly replacement is. Sometimes, though, we forget that it's maybe more than we really anticipate, right, just off the point of hiring another individual to replace that person. I read an article by Robert Maggie of the Great Little Box Company, which is a company up uh, in Vancouver, BC, and he said that every time he lost a senior staff member, it cost him somewhere between fifty dollars to $100,000. They sat down and did the math on it, figured it all out. I was like, that's ridiculous. There's no way it costs that much. But then when I started to sit down and think about the cost of lost work when we had an individual who was a key person who stepped out um, and we weren't able to complete that work on time for us to, whether it was bring on a recruiter or begin a whole process of finding an individual which sometimes could take up before we found them. Looks like uh, our screen just uh, cut out here. It's going to reconnect it and see if that will get us hooked back up. Hmm. 
anybody know any uh, tricks on uh, prompting the projector to recognize the screen here? I did that twice. Uh, should I leave it longer? Nothing? One of the function keys might have like a screen within the screen. Mm. I'm going to unplug it for a little bit longer here and see if that will do it. If not, we might have to go blind here for the next little bit. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, so I was talking about the cost of replacement of our employees and how that can um, be sometimes a lot greater than we anticipate or think. Uh, one of the other things that I read was that, um, this was by a guy named Greg, Gregory P. Smith, he said the top 10 reasons that people leave their jobs relate to the decision-making processes of management. And I was like, what? There's no way. Because I remember when I was losing my first employee, um, I thought he was leaving us because this downtown firm was going to be paying him more money and I couldn't match that money. And that does happen periodically, but a lot of times it's related to the decision-making processes of management and the relationship that they have with their direct supervisor. So that relationship, as I started to sit down and I started to do these interviews and I started to ask questions of people, of well, why, why would you leave that company? You got this great job, it's paying you well, it's close to your home, you don't have much of a commute, uh, you're doing what you're wanting to do, why leave? A lot of it would relate to the same sort of things I'd be hearing again and again. Well, I've been telling them for, you know, a year or two years straight that I really need to see this change or they just don't seem to be listening to me or I just have these ideas and, and they're just falling on deaf ears or they're saying yeah yeah we'll get to that but they never ever do and I just that's bothering me so as I um, this screen that's coming up here is that it is uh, first of six tips that I want to give and the first one is um, listen to your team uh, so for me, that was a huge lesson to recognize that I, I have to make sure I'm listening to my team and hearing what they're saying to me. Uh, I got involved with a podcast series that somebody recommended to me. It was called Manager Tools. And uh, if you go to manager-tools.com, you can check it out there. And there was three kind of uh, axioms to, to, to their management training that they emphasize. The first was one-on-ones, the second was feedback, and third was coaching. And the, the thing they said with one-on-ones that was really critical is that you need to meet every single week for half an hour with each of your directs. I was like, wow, half an hour? I mean, I meet with each of my directs each quarter uh, to kind of do a touch base and see how they're doing, but half an hour a week? What would you do with half an hour a week and how much time is that going to take out of your schedule and they kept saying it, it might seem like a lot of time but it actually is going to save you so much more time so basically their their advice was uh, break that high, half an hour into three sessions uh, the first uh, 10 minutes is anything they want to talk about the next 10 minutes is anything you want to talk about and the third 10 minutes is talk about their objectives and goals how they're doing in that regard because they need support there, they need help there, and that's really huge for them for their development. If they aren't developing and you're not supporting them in that development, that's going to really catch up on you. So I started to do that. I set that up right across the board through my company, setting up those one-on-ones. Everybody that was my directs, I would meet with them for that half an hour a week, and each of them who had directs would do the same. And that's really been making a huge difference to be able to have us um, have some time to listen to them, to hear how they're doing, and get outside of the day-to-day. -day. Not to just talk about your tasks and whatever, whatever project you're working on, but talking to them at a deeper level of how things were going, what challenges they were facing, 
and what kind of support they needed, and then what kind of coaching you could provide to help them be successful in their jobs. The next thing is um, making sure you act on what you hear. And this one really, really is huge. Because when I haven't acted on those things and I knew there was a problem there, even though they would have shared those with me and I did listen to them, it's just like not listening to them. It just extends the period of time that you have with them a little longer and then they're still gonna leave you. You have to act on that stuff and do something about it. The next is planning time to build relationships with them. This was tough for me too. Sometimes, like in the fall, I had some, maybe five weeks straight where I was working 70 hours a week. And the last thing I think I have is time to be able to build relationships with my team. But I've, I realized I actually had to put it in my calendar every single day, 12 o'clock, get up out of your seat, go to the lunchroom, sit down and hang out with the team, spend time with them, talk to them. Every day when you're walking in, walk around, walk up to their computers, say hi, say good morning, find out how their, their night went. Just talk to them really quickly or briefly when you have that opportunity. In the afternoons, we would do you know, 15 minutes periodically to just go walk across the street do a Starbucks coffee run. Those times are invaluable in building those relationships with your team. The next slide is tip two, keep the bar high. Uh, the first point was locking up our top talent. So one of the things I learned with devs is that devs are attracted to teams where there are very talented people on them, people who are smarter than them. And that if that company does not have somebody smarter than them, they're probably not going to want to go and work there because they always want to be learning. And so if you have some really, really smart people that you've attracted to your company and you've kind of developed them and helped them grow up to the point where they're at now and you let them go, you have lost a huge asset for you to be able to re retain your other people and also attract new people. So locking up those people is really important. The next is dealing with cancer quickly. So you might have a really skilled person, but if that person starts to develop a bad attitude and you start to meet with that individual and they just don't seem to change that attitude, and if they happen to be negative and they happen to be able to share their perspective about management or direction or the way things are happening at the company and they share that with other people in the company and it starts to poison them, you're in trouble. And you need to deal with that individual and you need to either get them to change their attitude or it's time to encourage them to maybe move on and look for another spot to work. Even though it's tough, even though they're super skilled and they're a really great person, if they are not helping you and getting behind you and working with you to move the company forward and being that cheerleader you need on your team to help get behind the decisions that you're making as a leader in the company, then you need to do something about that. The next is setting goals and outlining clear objectives. Nobody likes a company that's all over the map. If they feel like the leadership of the company is constantly switching, changing directions, knee-jerk pain decisions all the time, they lose all respect for leadership. And they're like, I can't work here. I love the people here, but this, this is not working for me. They want to see a direction, a set of train tracks that you guys are all heading on together, and they're excited about that direction, and it's in front of them. And so what we do is we'll at the start of the year, we'll meet with our leadership, we'll put out our goals for the year. There's a great book um, written by a guy named Vern Harnish called The Rockefeller Habits, and uh, it outlines a, a way that you can communicate and disseminate this vision all the way down through your company. And each year you set those goals and you create rocks. And those rocks are measurable objectives that you can smash. And you basically aim to create at the very max, five of them every quarter, because no business can do more than that. If you are trying to do more than that, you're never accomplishing them and it's frustrating for your team. So basically, you want to lay those out in front of them and ideally, we've, we've learned that we've had to narrow those down to even three. What's that? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, we're having a problem with it. So we'll have narrowed those down now to even three rocks because we found five is even too hard to do because if you get back up in front of your team again and say well we accomplished three of them but we didn't accomplish the other two of them it's still a letdown and the, the clarity that they get around those rocks is huge 
because it, it really gives them the direction, the focus that we all can rally around towards. Here's the things we need to improve in our company, or here's the things we're going to, to build that are going to help us work towards our vision. And so being able to, to have those in front of your people is good. So the book, again, is called The Rockefeller Habits by Vern Harnish. I'd encourage all of you, if you're a management person or a person that's uh, starting a company, I wish I had seen this stuff 10 years ago when I was first starting out my business. The next is holding them accountable. Once you help identify individual goals with your team members, you need your management, your leadership, your supervisors to be working with them to hold them accountable to those things. People love the structure of accountability. As long as it's fair, as long as the feedback is helping them grow and develop, they want to grow. They want to be uh, in an environment where they're being coached and directed in a positive way. One of the tools we use is a tool called Small Improvements. Small Improvements, if, if you want to check it out, is small-improvements.com. It's a uh, performance management tool. And kind of the secret behind it is that everything you're doing within your business and helping individuals grow is about small improvements. It's about being able to deliver feedback in both positive and negative instances to help them move towards their goals, towards company goals, and never, ever give them surprises. Nobody likes it when you get to a performance review three months later, six months later, and all of a sudden, bam, here's all of these things you've been doing wrong. That's terrible. What you want to have is an environment that's safe, and every single week at the one-on-one -on -one or just in conversation you're having with your employees, you're getting that feedback now, and it's done in a way that's respectful, and it's about helping you develop and grow. And if you can nurture that type of healthy environment, it makes them feel stable and safe, and they feel like they can flourish, and that you really care about them, and that's critical. There's lots of other good tools out there too. Small Improvements happens to be the one that we chose, but uh, there's some other good ones. Work.com is a good one that's uh, owned by Salesforce, uh, and there's a few others that are available too. I can give you that information afterwards if you're interested. The next tip, how are we doing for time? How much? Nine. Nine minutes? Okay. Uh, the next tip is keeping them challenged. Developers hate getting bored. Like that just kills them in a job. And it's hard to always have interesting stuff in front of them, like cool projects and great big name clients and stuff like that. Sometimes you got to do some maintenance. Sometimes you got to do some support work. That's very challenging to be able to keep your devs always interested. So how do you do that? What are, I've been talking a lot. I just want to see out here in the audience, how have you guys been tackling this issue to keep your devs interested when maybe they're starting to get bored on a project? Working on the driven core always seems to be the trick for always hard problems. It's, it's interesting if you can find that. that devs seem to love to contribute. And that, that refreshes them often when they get that opportunity to be involved in that, giving back to the project. Great. I like doing something that's a little different. I, I like doing like a game night. Mm. It, it doesn't actually stimulate any work. But what it does is that it creates team building and it makes it say, like, oh, okay, yeah, this might suck. But at least I'm doing it with team people, with people that I get along with and I'm having a lot of fun. Awesome. Does you need to get back in there? Yeah. yeah. So the next one is um, fostering initiatives. So one of the things we've done is we've created like a monthly dev day, and we've said to our dev teams, and this came from um, Google, because they were uh, doing this kind of concept, and there was this company in uh, Australia that, that uh, was doing it too. I forget their name right now, but we just basically said to them, for this dev day, every month you can work on anything you want to work on. Come to your director of technology, you pitch your idea to him, if it's something that you feel could help the business or you feel it's something that could help the open source community of Drupal, you come tell us what it is and how you want to work on it. And they get so energized by that that they get to work on something that they can or that will help with a project. Like for us, we're working on OpenEDU within our own company. It's a, a distro we're creating for the higher ed space. And they love working on that. And it's a real energizer day for them. So there's different ways you can do that. And uh, you can help your team keep on track.
The final one is keeping that company direction in view at all times. For us, uh, keeping that in front of them on the core value side, we've, had, we've got our core values posted on the wall within our main dev room uh, there so that they can constantly see here's what we stand for, here's our values, and we want to bring that back to them in all of our team meetings. Each meeting we're wanting to highlight a different value within the company. And same with our vision. So every time we have an opportunity, every Monday morning we have our, our all team meeting and then every Friday when we have our lunch and learn, we're bringing them back to the things that matter to our company, where we're going as a company, to help them keep focused so they don't lose that focus and start to forget what it is we're trying to accomplish, what it is we're trying to do. Oh, we got it. Awesome. Thank you very much. Round of applause. Yeah. Okay. What is it saying that for? It's telling me it's saying that I'm not allowed to uh, ex put this up because it's saying I don't have enough RAM memory. Uh, all right, that's that's fun. Let's just uh, do it without the slides. So the next is rewarding them. Uh, the next tip, uh, uh, first one's real clear and obvious: remunerating them very well, um, not just from a financial perspective, but in all the perks that you'll offer as an organization, making sure you've done your, your due diligence to check and see what are the industry standards, what are people being paid, make sure everything you're doing is fair. Secondly, um, recognizing them publicly. Uh, every week at our team meetings, I'll be connecting with our management, I'll be saying to them, what's some guys in the last week that have been doing stuff awesome? Let's catch people doing stuff good, take those notes down, put them in the agenda as we're preparing for the meeting, and let's share that team-wide. We also use small improvements to send out team-wide praise to different individuals on the team, and that goes a long way to keep people encouraged, to, to, to show them that we're watching. And then uh, finally is incentives. However you do incentives, we do a bonus structure within our company to kind of help encourage people to... Um, really do that, go the extra mile, so that they can not only um, help us hit our goals as an organization and hit our profitability goals, but that they can gain something from that too that will come back to them. There's a really good book by Daniel Pink called Drive that you may want to read that uh, talks a lot about motivation and how to set up motivational structures within your organization that are gonna be helpful and not a hindrance, because some of them can really be a hindrance. Uh, if you just go out there and experiment and start you know, throwing bonuses out there, sometimes you can find that they'll actually work against some of the other things that you uh, will have going on within your organization that could potentially hurt you. Next is creating a stellar workplace. Um, first is investing in the workplace. This has been huge for us. We've found that creating, like, I mean, you spend 40 hours, sometimes 45, maybe even 50 hours of your week in this one place. Make sure it's a place they'll really want to come to. So when we moved into our new space, which is in Burnaby, which is one of the suburbs of Vancouver, we sat down with our team, we got a whiteboard out, and we said, what are all the things that you would like to have in this space? And so they started to throw out all their ideas, and we started throwing them up on there. We want a massage chair, and we want to have a basketball hoop, and we want to have a dartboard, and we want to have a foosball table, and we want to have uh, a cool uh, area where we can just hang out, and we want to have a chalk wall where we can write on the wall. And, so we did all of those things, and we put them all into our, our space. We're just now doubling our space in, in Burnaby, and now we're, we've done this again. We pulled out the chalkboard again, got a whole pile of new ideas, and we put it in place. And then we started to say, well, our remote workers aren't getting the same stuff here too. So we decided to do, okay, we're going to put in big flat screens into our office, and now we've, we've got a new tool we're going to be implementing. It's just in the beta stage right now. It's called Squibble. And we're going to use Squibble, and it's kind of cool, but basically all of our remote workers will be up on the screen. It does a 15 second, uh, every 15 seconds it will do a screen capture, so you can see the image of, of them in their rooms. And as, they walk, as we walk around to different rooms, we can just click on their face, and they, that will turn the video on for them so they can talk to us in that room. So they can interact with us in five different rooms within our space, and they can interconnect with us whenever they want, or we can interconnect with them whenever they want. So that's going to be cool to be able to help us connect better with our remote team. And they're, they've already been giving us feedback about how excited they are about that opportunity. Um, 
Next is, is um, creating a, a cool and fun atmosphere. I've covered that one. And, and the, the, the part of it that I didn't cover is that when we've, we've kind of looked at each of the individuals within our company, we recognize every single person is unique and different. And so our, our HR coordinator has been fantastic with this, but she's actually gone around. And in the orientation process, she's learned every single thing that that individual likes in terms of like, what do you like? What's your favorite candy? What's your favorite dessert? What's your favorite meal? Blah, blah, blah. She'll go through all of those things and she documents it all. She puts it into our um, HR program called Bamboo HR. And then she will utilize that information all throughout the year on different things. So she'll stock up the fridge with all their favorite drinks, all their favorite snacks, and at their birthday, she'll make sure she gets their favorite cake. And all of those little things make a real big difference for an employee to feel like, wow, they remembered, they cared about these types of things. So it's the little stuff. Oftentimes, it's not a huge expenditure you have to put out. It's those little things that can really matter to your employees. The final one is investing in their growth, creating a good training environment, protecting their time, budgeting for conferences and events, and providing great resources. So on the first one, a good training environment, this has been huge for us when we've been bringing in juniors and we're not ready to really train those juniors and we throw them into situations that are over their head and we burn them out in you know, six months or a year and they leave and you see that look on their face as they, they leave us because they've been overwhelmed and we feel terrible. We know we didn't do a good job. We need to provide the support so that they're going to be successful. Protecting their time. I think someone at the back mentioned it earlier about uh, uh, the first, first couple of guys that, that uh, you burned out. That uh, I know I've been there before. I've burned out some guys who just completely overworked them. And uh, one of the things we've implemented to help with that is a bank time program where we now if guys will work 40 hours or more a week, we'll bank their time up so they can take that time off at a later date because being able to protect their time is really, really critical. And as a business owner, sometimes that's tough as you look at you know, your budget and you look at your timelines and you go, can I lose those individuals for that extra time? I really need them. But if you don't and they don't recoup that time and you don't look at the balance of their health versus their work, it will catch up on you and it's not good. The next is budgeting time for the conferences and events. Um, we, are, we put aside 1500 bucks a year per person to be able to say whatever it is that you want to do for your education, you can utilize that funds. You've got to go to your supervisor, make a proposal and say, here's how I'd like to spend this funds, but you, it's up to you. So some of them, uh, our marketing guy just used uh, some on a digital marketing conference. Uh, our devs, a lot of them will use it towards DrupalCon to go to that. Some of them, uh, the UX guys will go to UX conferences, but allowing them to, to have that input on how they want to develop their skills, uh, there's many different ways you can do that. So some final thoughts. Um, three things I want to leave you with. The first is relationships are key, and they take work. You're constantly needing to work at relationships. When you don't work at those relationships, relationships will immediately start to break down. And so it's it's remembering that and making sure your leadership, your management are keeping on that so that you're always working on keeping those relationships strong, your communication channels open. The second is listening and be consistent in following through. And finally, that there's no one winning solution, both on the recruiting front and on the retention front. That there's many, many factors and it's a full-time job for those of you who are um, CEOs, for those of you who are managing a team uh, as a CEO myself, I probably spend 70% of my time in recruiting and HR. It's such a big, important part of my business because our people are our greatest assets. And if we have great people and they're performing well, we're going to be successful. And that's it. Thank you very much. We're over time, so I don't know if we have time for any formal questions or not. But if not, if you want to talk about anything, please feel free to come on. Yeah. Great. Thanks a lot.